Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's NRAT webinar. My name's Bennett. I'll be the moderator for today. Our presenter is Aaron Clapp, Application Specialist at SAI. He knows everything there is to know about NRAT, and today he'll be showing us how to work with layers in order to stay organized and efficient when working in NRAT. After the presentation, we'll be able to answer any questions you have either about layers or any other NRAP topics. So feel free to put those questions in the chat and we'll answer as many as we can. We are recording the webinar as always. So if you want to review anything Aaron discusses, we'll be sending you all the link here this afternoon. So look out for that. And that's about it for me. So I'll turn it over to Aaron. All right, sounds good. So layers, this is gonna be kind of a key lesson in our roadmap to next month where we're going to talk about creating a 3d sign from scratch so the reason why is because using layers and kind of wrapping your head around getting used to using them uh, is a good idea for several reasons but uh, once you get into multiple tool paths and overlapping tool paths things like that uh, having layers is almost uh, essential. Uh, I don't know that I would be able to do it without it. Uh, so the key here is going to be, okay, uh, once we, let's take a brief overview of layers. We'll get into some examples and then we'll get into a more of a complex example that I've created to kind of show us, you know, what, you know, what we're going to be kind of looking at to kind of previewing something close to what we're going to be doing next week, uh, maybe much more simplified. But so layers uh, in en route, um, we have layers tab right up here, front and center. So in the top left hand corner, we've got our layers. Uh, by default, layer one is there. Uh, if you're in older versions of NROUTE, sometimes this layers option is not on. And so you have to just go into uh, your uh, view and turn on layers, uh, whatnot. So we have the option for choosing a layer, and then we also have option to, to show all layers. We'll get into show all layers in a minute, but those are your two kind of buttons there uh, right now. If we click up here, this will help us get into define layers. So this is gonna be where we create layers, we rename them um, and things like that. Here, we can assign colors, uh, we can turn them on, we can lock them, we can move lock them, we can do all sorts of things. We can change the orientation. Uh, if we create multiple layers, we can move them up or down you know, whether we want to reorganize the layers, things like that. So we can remove the empty layers. Uh, we can do all sorts of things in here. So this is going to where you manage your layers. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but you know, self pretty self-explanatory. You can add, delete, remove empty. Uh, this one is probably the only one that I'll kind of explain. The remove empty layer is really good for if, uh, for example, you've been doing nesting. And uh, a lot of times when you do nesting, uh, it'll create multiple layers. In fact, we can kind of demonstrate that here. Let's go make our plate a little bit bigger. And let's just draw some shapes on screen here just to kind of give us a little bit of visual interest here. So let's just say we're going to nest these. I'm just going to quickly nest and I'm going to do 60 of them. And then uh, apply that nest. All right, so you can see here up here in our nested layers, now it's created a bunch of layers for us. This is basically uh, all the layers that it created for the nest. Well, let's just say I didn't particularly like that nest, and then I go to delete these files. Well, maybe I forgot to put the toolpath on, and I'm like, oh, shoot, I got to you know, get rid of those. Well, now you've got a bunch of <clears throat> empty layers. Um, uh, if we deleted all, all the, the objects. So I turned on all layers here and I deleted everything. And now we've got a bunch of empty layers. So in order to get rid of those, you could either 
go back into here and delete them one by one, or you can just click on the remove empty. It will remove all the empty ones and leave the ones that are not empty open for you. So this is kind of a nice way to, to address that. And so that's, uh, that's a good way to get rid of any excess layers that are not necessary, that don't have anything in them in order to simplify things by that. The move up and down, this is nice for when you decide to go to output. So if we were to output some, some objects, and let's throw a quick tool path on here so that we can actually get that screen up. Uh, and we go to output. One of the options in our create output is layer. So I could actually make that my number one priority if I really wanted to. So if I had, you know, my my cut my uh, layers organized by how I want them cut, in which order I want them cut, I could put layer at number one, and then I could use my two, three, and four to define how I want the tools in that layer to cut in the appropriate order. So if you have multiple tools in a layer, then you could have it cut by layer first, and then once it gets to that layer, you could have it do maybe drilling first, and then you know, island fill second or whatever. So layer can be really helpful in terms of ordering. Uh, I'm gonna put this back down at the bottom here for our example. So those are some kind of simple and easy things to kind of think about with layers, but probably the one that I run into the most or, or the one that I think is gonna be most helpful is going to be when creating different signs and, and different pieces. Um, Many times, uh, and I'm going to import a uh, uh, a cabinet file here. Uh, a lot of times, if you get files, know that Enroute's import functions for DXF and DWG also support layers. Layers are really helpful in terms of tool pathing. So the one thing that we can use layers for is to make tool pathing easier for us. So in this particular example. Um, I have a cabinet part and maybe somebody sent this to me, a customer or, or, you know, I've got maybe a bunch of them from a cabinet software that I have. Um, and if I don't use ATP, uh, I can see here that I've got, well, I got a bunch of nested layers, as you can see, but then I've got uh, my other layers. So why don't we go in and remove the empty ones. Okay, there we go. And now we're back to normal. So now when I first import the file, something to note about NROUTE, there are sometimes uh, in certain circumstances where NROUTE will forcibly show you uh, all layers, uh, whether you have them turned on or not. So right now I actually don't even have the turn on all layers option clicked, but it is showing me all the layers. And that's because it doesn't wanna confuse you when you import a file so that you think, oh, well, hey, where did my, there's only part of the file here, what's wrong? So when it first imports it, it shows you all the layers. And then as you were to click, if I click into other layers, now some of those parts go away. So you can kind of see how that happens. That also happens right after a nest. When you uh, nest files, uh, that also happens. It automatically turns on the all layers so that you can see all the layers nested so that you know that it did something. And then once you choose each layer, it just shows you the individual. And if you wanna go back to that view, you would just need to turn on all layers and you can get back to that view. So just something to note, there are some times when NRA will show you all the layers when you don't have the option turned on, be aware that that's probably just a, a time where it's trying to show you something that did something or that it has something so that you're not get confused about whether it imported all the layers or not. So tool pathing. So if I had to tool path this particular object, just like this, this would be kind of a pain because I'm gonna to have to come in here and select these pieces and tediously go through here and add these to my selection, whether I do it this way or by clicking on it, it's just not a great experience. And then once I do that, I have tool paths layered on top of each other which can get a little complicated. So if I'm designing a file like this from scratch or I get them, one of the ways that you can toolpath 
is it's really nice in this particular case because this came from a KCD file. So it automatically has all the layers, but I can now I can click to each one of my layers and I can now much more efficiently select all the pieces that I need to toolpath for one type of toolpath. This is really helpful for like five millimeter holes. Now I don't have to sit there and try and navigate through a bunch of stuff. I can just highlight these. So this is a good idea to do not only when you import files, but when you're creating files. I do know some customers that don't have cabinet softwares and they use like the Boxster program to create boxes and little cabinets. Um, it's good to keep these in separate letter, uh, uh, layers. So we draw one thing, uh, put it in a layer, then draw some other things, put that in a layer and, and whatnot. So it's, it's good to keep those apart because if I ever have to come back and toolpath this, this is super easy for me to do now. All I have to say is say drill centers and we'll put a drill in here. Now I've got those drills. Now, when I turn on layers, I can see that those are my drill holes. Now, the good thing here is that if I ever had to come back to this file and change it, maybe I don't want five millimeter holes. Maybe I want smaller holes or bigger holes. It's easy as just coming back to the file, going to the layer, selecting it, deleting that toolpath, and then just reapplying it with something else. This makes life a lot easier if you can organize things into layers. It just simplifies the whole process there. Now, one other thing to know about layers is how we move objects to and from layers. Now, I'm going to go ahead and close this file, and we are going to move to a blank new file. And let's just draw some stuff on screen here. So let's do this and get some text. Let's make sure that's uniform there. Put that about in the middle. It's good enough. And then maybe we'll do, uh, just for fun, we'll do an inline on this. So we'll do an inline. Oh, oops, I'm clicking the wrong thing. There we go. And we want that square and apply. Okay, so we got a nice little graphic here. Not anything complicated, but if let's say that I want to create some stuff and I want to move some of this stuff around. So I want to create layers and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I'm going to get organized and I want to create layers. How do I move something from one layer to another? Well, it's easy. I can do one of several ways. My favorite way is just hitting control X. If you want to copy it or, or cut it, sorry. Um, that removes it from the, from the graphic. Or if I hit copy, I can then create a new layer, okay? And then I can go to that layer. And now here's where you gotta pay attention. When I right click, I don't wanna hit paste. If I hit paste, it will actually paste another copy on top of layer one. I'm in layer two. So I need to say paste to active layer. The great thing about this is that it pastes it exactly in the same place it was copied it from. It was copied from. This is super important because when you're building a multi-layer file, you need to make sure that your layers stay consistent in terms of their positioning. It would be extremely difficult to try and sit here and mirror up your layers and get them to line up properly if you didn't have this option. So if I had to turn on layers now my original in in here is still there and i still have my text here and you'll notice that when i go back to this layer and i turn on all layers they're exactly on top of each other so technically i have actually have two of these one on top of the other so note that so when you copy stuff make sure you either copy it or cut it whichever one you want and then make sure you use that paste to active layer that's gonna be the one that transfers it to the new layer and puts it in there. And 
another benefit for this kind of thing, and, and this is kind of where we're going to get into organization of tool pathing. I drew this specific shape uh, uh, intentionally because I wanted to try and illustrate why layers are a good idea once we start getting into more two and a half D or, or more complex shapes and things like that. So for example, um, I'm going to start by, I'm just going to throw on some tool paths here, some easy stuff. Um, and let's do a routing offset. We'll throw it, that's fine, uh, our end mill. And then let's say we want to do an island fill um, right here. So we're going to do, we need to actually convert this to curves here real quick. There we go. Uh, we're going to do an island fill, and we want these letters to stand out. So we're going to cut all the area around it down, and the letters are going to stand up. So we're going to do a little bit of an island fill, and we'll just use our, our half-inch tool here uh, just to be consistent here. And uh, let's just go 0.5 inches down. That's fine. Hit OK. Uh, whoops, now what did I do? Oh, okay, now see, that was a mistake. I had all my layers turned on. So I need to turn off the layers and go back to layer one. So here we have this. I want to do an island fill on this guy. There we go. Okay. Uh, oh, you know what? I need to, okay, to actually to properly illustrate this, um, I need to actually delete everything because uh, I actually put everything in different layers. So let's uh, let's turn off all layers. Let's do this, copy. Let's delete everything in all the layers and then start from layer one. We're going to use paste active layer. Okay. So we're going to do like we did before. We're going to go ahead and do a rotting offset. That's going to rot through the material. Then I'm going to select both of these objects and then try and do an island fill. So here's one of the things that you're, that you're going to run into. So this is one of the illustrations here. So we're all in layer one. There's nothing in layer two. And what happened was, is I put my outside cut on and then I did my island fill, but look what it did. It actually put the island fill on the letters instead and I didn't want that. So this is another reason why we would want to use layers because sometimes when you try and stack tool paths on top of each other, it becomes, or uh, the, the container hole system in NREP doesn't work properly. So what should have happened, if I go back a couple steps here, what should have happened is I should have gotten an island fill that looks like this. This is what I originally wanted. Now, if I try and grab this, and let's say I try and do an island fill or a routing offset on this, now look what it does. It does a routing offset on the outside, and then it attempts to put one in here because when I did the island fill, it actually groups together the two objects. So the end route seven and the outside shape actually kind of get clumped together or grouped together when you do that. It's because so that when you, once you've tool path it, you don't want those pieces to move around. And so it kind of groups them together. And so because they're grouped now, now I can't actually apply a routing offset to the outside without getting a routing offset inside the letters. So, okay, well, how would I solve that? Well, without layers, this becomes a little more difficult. So what would I have to do? Well, I would have to, if this is the same shape that I wanted to use, I would have to somehow make another duplicate copy of this line on top of this line in order to do this properly. And that's not something I even wanna try and get into. If I have to apply one tool path to two lines that share the exact same space 
it is going to be impossible for me to try and click the line that's underneath this line. So this is where layers come in. This is where we say, okay, enough of that. Let's split things up so that we don't have to try and worry about stacking tool paths on top of each other. Stacking tool paths is never a good idea. Not only does it create the scenario that we illustrated here, but it also creates a scenario where if you ever had to go back and edit one of those tools, let's say that your half inch tool snapped and you realize that you don't have another one and you had to switch to another tool, like a quarter inch tool to get the job done or something like that, right? You needed to make another copy of this sign. Well, now what do you have to do? Well, now you'd have to completely remove all of the tool paths and then remember how you stacked those tool paths when you first tool pathed it maybe like a week ago. Good luck. I, I can't even order. I, sometimes I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. I'm not going to be able to remember what order I did. I'm going to have to play with it. I'll tool path it. I'll do it wrong. Have to undo it, redo it. Stacking tool paths is just not great. If everything is in layers, I can go back, kind of like how we showed in the first file with the with the uh, the cabinet part. You can just go back to that specific layer where that specific tool is used. Right click on the tool path, edit that tool path, add the new tool, hit OK, and it retool paths. Done. Just like that. You don't have to try and remember order of tool paths, how you stack them on there to get it to work. None of that nonsense. So how do we, you know, what does it look like to have a file that's well built with layers? Well, I want to open up a file for you here to show you a little project that I was working on just to, for uh, our visual interest here. So here is a kind of a 3D-ish looking sign that I put together, it's real simple. It's, it's not even, we're not even using 3D textures here. All I'm using is two-dimensional tool paths uh, and, and some uh, 3D engrave. So what we would call two and a half D um, tool pathing. So when I open the file, uh, it shows me all the layers. So I can see all the layers mixed in here. And if I were looking at this and trying to figure out how I tool path this without layers, this would be impossible, right? So I'm going to turn on all layers and turn them off. So now we can see that I split this up into several pieces. I'm like, OK, now I'm starting to get the picture here. Now I've got all the different parts. So I've got my outside cut. I have a cut, a uh, fill cut that I copied the outside and I copied the letters. And then I created this little, uh, I just created an outline because what I want to happen with this particular file is I want the background to be cut down. I want there to be a half an inch uh, lip around the edge or border around the edge. And then, so this little, uh, this little red line, I want that to stand out from the background. So I'm going to, I'm going to mill the background down to, I think it's a uh, half an inch. And then I want this red layer to stand up 0.125 inches. And then I want to do a 3D engrave on the letters. So this particular layer, all this layer is doing is it's addressing the hatch fill that's going to go half an inch down into the material that's going to make this part stand out. Then I can go to my center cut and I'm going to cut this down so that it's only a quarter or 0.125 inches above the rest of the background. And then the last layer is going to have my engraved tool path where I put the engrave on top of, of the file. So this is kind of a simple file. And why don't we just take a few minutes and let's just try and recreate this file with the tools you know, with the tools that we have. And I'll kind of give you a walkthrough. That kind of, you see some kind of practical examples of way how we edit this, how we, how we do it, so that we can kind of get to an end goal there. But before we do that, I wanted to just kind of preview this file for you so you can kind of get an idea of what the end goal or what my end goal was when I set this file up. So let's do a simulate 3D. Bump this up just a little bit. I'm going to animate this. 
Uh, I'm going to check my order to make sure that that looks good. So strategy, hatch fill, island fill. Yeah, that looks good. Tool. That looks okay. All right, so update, and I'm going to turn 3D on. Okay, so we're just going to simulate this here and let it go. Maybe a little bit faster. Okay, so it's doing the milling out, and then it's cutting off the platform, routing, and cutting off the edge. Okay, so this is what that sign is supposed to look like, right? Pretty simple. I'm cutting it down. It's going to have a border on the edge. And then I want this to stand out from the background. And then I want my text to kind of have a little bit of a sunken in texture with them uh, on there to kind of give it like a 3D effect. So that's kind of what the sign looks like. Let's start from fresh, walk through it. You can see how I create these layers and kind of what I do. So having a good idea of what you want the sign to look like ahead of time also helps. Um, so that uh, will help you along the way as well. All right. Let's, let's start a brand new file. Let's do, okay, one inches. Let's do 40 by 40. Just to kind of keep our view centered here. Let's create a uh, rectangular shape here. I don't know what I want this to be, but let's just do something wider than it is tall. So maybe 20 by 11, something like that. There we go. And OK, so in order to create that outside cut, um, I'm going to do an outline on this. So we're going to do offset. And I want that to be an external offset. And I want that to be half inch thick. So I'm going to say 0.5 and apply. OK, so now at first here, I'm going to just start throwing stuff on screen. So, um, you know, letters and text and stuff like that. And then as I kind of go along, I'm going to start to split parts of it off and then merge it into different layers. So I'm going to copy and paste it into different layers, you know, but at Initially, I want to kind of just design in one layer, kind of get some of the base pieces down, and then I can start moving stuff to different layers. So this is where we'll do our text. We're obviously going to have to resize this. That's OK. We'll highlight this and oops, let's go the opposite way here. Not quite going to fit. Let's go a little bit smaller. A little more. There we go. OK, and then let's convert this to curves so that we're dealing with lines and arcs. OK, so let's build the platform. So let's put that together. So let's grab this. And the way that I did that little platform was I just went to our offset. And I think I did like a 0.8 or something like that. And let's do it rounded. Oops. There we go, rounded so it's nice and smooth, and apply. There we go, close. Well, that didn't apply twice, did it? No, it didn't. Okay, good. All right, so now we've got some base pieces, and now I have to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with all these pieces, and, and what do I need? So uh, I'm going to start by going to my layers, and I'm going to say this first layer, we're just going to make this first layer the outside cut. Right. There we go. Now I'm going to add just a couple of new layers here um, and hit OK. So now what I can say is, OK, this is the outside cut. I really don't need anything else inside this layer. So I'm going to actually highlight the rest of it. I'm going to hit Control X. I'm going to cut it away from this layer. I'm going to go to layer two. And I'm going to hit Paste to Active Layer. OK. so. Now I'm thinking to myself, OK, what else do I need in this particular file to, or in this particular layer to accomplish the island fill part? So like I had in the previous file. So all I need for the island fill is really these two shapes right here. And then I can do the island fill. So technically, I don't need these letters. And you don't have to follow this exact example you know, in the way that I do it. Um, 
sometimes you could just start building things and, and, and doing things and moving stuff around. So, you know, don't, you don't need to follow this exact folder. It just works for or this exact path. It, it kind of fits for what I'm doing here, but so the letters, well, I don't need the letters in this layer. So cut them out, get them out of there. And we'll go to layer two and call this the uh, eyes, the island fill cut down. That's what I named it before. So that's going to fill that in. And I always like to put names that are meaningful to me so that when I look at them in the, uh, the thing here, uh, the drop down list, I can actually kind of figure out what it is that I'm, I'm clicking on next. We go to layer three, and then I'm going to say paste to active layer. And then this is where I'm going to do my engrave tool path. And at this point, I think I'm good. Uh, there was one other thing I think I did in the other file um, that I won't get into at the moment here. But we've got our three layers, and I'm going to go ahead and rename this one to our um, Engrave layer and this layer. Let's just delete that layer for now. Okay, so now I've got all my layers, and that should not be in layer one. Okay, yeah, it's just a visual thing there. If I turn on all layers, now I've got all my pieces here, and I can start the tool path. So outside cut. Then I come in here and let's say tool path. We'll do our routing offset. And if I want to cut all the way through the material, we use our half inch for that. Hit OK. I'm going to do my island fill. So that's I'm going to select this guy and this guy. Oh, you know what? That's what I was missing. That's what I need that fourth layer for. Uh, I need an island fill to mill out the area between here and here. But I also, because when I do that island fill, I actually need to be able to cut, it's going to leave this kind of un uncut, basically standing uh, free. So I actually need to take this and go one more layer deep. So I'm going to copy this one instead of cutting it this time. So I'm going to copy it. That's what that fourth layer was for. Couldn't remember. So this is going to be the center. Down. And let's go down to that and we'll paste. Oh, see, I made a mistake. Hit undo, paste to active layer. There we go. And now in my layers here, I think I'm going to move this one up a little bit because I want my engrave to be less, uh, just so that they're in a, a little bit neater order there. Okay, so island fill. So I'm going to highlight both of these. We'll do our island fill here. And I'm just going down to half an inch. Uh, that's all the deeper, the deep I want it. So we'll just do that. And then I'm going to go down to my center cut down. Uh, now this is the centerpiece. When I did the island fill, this is actually still a half an inch tall. Now in this particular case, I actually want this only to be uh, 0.125 inches of, well, let's do, Let's do a half an inch or a quarter inch above the deep half half inch cut. So technically, we're going to cut this down. If we have one inch material, we're going to cut this down a quarter inch. So it'll be 0.7 inches tall. And then the base around it will be 0.5 inches thick. So we'll do another island fill here. A same tool, except for this time, we're going to cut it at 0.25. And now our engrave layer. Last but not least, let's do our engrave. Uh, and this is the way that I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to go in. I'm going to create an island fill. I'm going to clear this tool. And I'm going to grab a really small tool. So probably like an eighth inch end mill. And uh, whoops. No, no, that's right. And then I'm going to grab my conic. So we'll grab our conic and put those in there. OK, so we've got our island fill. And our conic. What this is going to do is if you just do a regular conic tool on some letters like this, you'll get like, especially if the letters are fairly large, 
you're going to get like a little peak in the middle uh, of the tool path uh, or inside of the cut. If you want that flat bottom on the letters, you need to add an end mill first and then use the 90 or use your conic tool as a clean tool. And then what you do is for your end mill, I am going to use a surface setting of 0.25. Now, what this actually does, and you don't use surface very often, but because in my previous tool path, I'm because I'm actually milling down the surface of that centerpiece down 0.25 inches, that means I need to lower my surface because if I leave it at the top of the plate where the, the material is, it's just going to cut in the air. So because I've milled down the surface of this object, I actually need to lower the surface just a little bit. So one of the rare cases where you're going to use this, and then we're going to say 0.25 inches on the depth. I think that should be okay. And we'll click. Click OK. And then on our second tool, I'm going to make sure I click the 3D tool path option. We'll do the same here. So 0.25 and 0.25. Click OK and OK. So that's going to give me a little bit of an end mill in the middle here to clear out some of this in some areas like that. All right. And that's basically it. I've got all my layers set up. So now that I turn on all layers to output, you can see that they're all stacked on top of each other, but I can always get to every single one of these tool paths if I ever make a mistake, which there's going to be a mistake uh, in this. Uh, I can guarantee you because uh, I, I purposely forgot a step. So let's preview the file. So let's go to machining 3D. Bump this up a little bit and play and then turn the graphics on here. And we'll just let this cut. OK, so the mistake that we made is you can kind of see those little peaks that are kind of left over here. See those little gnarly peaks. Also, the other mistake that I made is I didn't use a small enough tool. So you can kind of see that I still have a little bit of peaking going on here. See these little peaks in the middle? So if I wanted to completely get rid of those, I'd probably need to even go to a smaller tool. So maybe like a 16th engine mill, and that would do the trick. Now, the other problem is these little, these little pieces that didn't get left over. I cut the bottom out, and then I cut this top out. Well, what happens is the edge of the end mill is cutting right along this edge. And so I actually need to cut over the edge just a little bit to knock off these little pieces. So not a problem, no big deal, because I've done it in layers. So all I got to do is go back into here and say, all right, I need to overcut this slightly, which means uh, if we look at our tool path here, that's what we used. I'm going to delete our tool path, and I'm going to draw and maybe just go an offset of 0.125, something really tiny. Apply, close. I'm going to get rid of the original, delete it. And then I'm going to go back in here, reapply my island fill, turn on all layers, simulate the 3D. Now they're gone. But just like that, I, I mean, I'm able to easily go back in, change something, take a look at it, see what it looks like, and go back and forth. This is, again, this is going to be really crucial once we start talking about the 3D sign that we talk about next week, where we're going to go into, you know, masking off uh, three-dimensional back, uh, 3D, uh, 3D reliefs so that we have like a textured background back here. Um, so instead of just being flat uh, and things like that. So it's going to be really important to keep these in separate layers so that we can or organize the tool paths and we don't have to try and stack everything on top of each other in the same layer. So hopefully this kind of shows the idea behind 
why we want to use layers so much. You know, it doesn't have to be something super complicated. It could just be something as simple as, hey, I need to apply two different tool paths with the same geometry, and I don't want to have to try and figure out how to select a line that's on top of each other. I don't know if anybody of you have ever uh, had a case where you you had some geometry and somehow there was duplicate lines like this where I click on it and then there's another line underneath it. I don't know if you've ever had that problem before. Sometimes it can happen when importing files and things like that. But imagine trying to click one of the lines and then toolpath this line and then drag this line back on top of it so it matches it and then try and and then try and add another toolpath. It, it becomes a headache. It's it's a waste of time. And then sometimes you can't get it to, to line up right and, and you end up problems with, with different parts and they don't cut right. Uh, it's just a lot of inefficiency. So layers, even with the most simple of designs, can be used to, to effectively cut down some of the work that you have to do when you're stacking your tool paths. And the great thing is all you have to do at the very end when you're ready to tool path is you just turn on all the layers and it'll output everything that you that you see on screen. So all the layers will get output uh, in their proper order. So that's layers. Again, this is kind of another one of those stepping stones that we've been taking in order to get to that uh, coveted uh, next month webinar where we talk about 3d sign building a 3d sign from the from the ground up so we wanted to cover a lot of things about reliefs 3d tool pathing and things like that before we got to that because if i tried to just do that lesson in and of itself it, it wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense um and it probably would have gone too long so hopefully you can use layers i think you could use layers uh you'll be happy uh about it and uh, it'll save you so much time. So any questions before we uh, before we go? I know that went a little bit long, but uh, I think it was worth it. <clears throat> I did have one question from Jasper while you were presenting. I, I, I think it got answered. Jasper, let us know if you have any further questions on it. He was asking if you are recommending um, a different layer for each tool or tool path. But I believe Aaron answered that question for you as he was... No yeah so not necessarily you may have uh, multiple objects um in the same layer uh so it doesn't have to be relegated to one thing per per layer basically what i want to do at this point is i just want to say let's remove the overlapping stuff the stuff that might cause me to get confused when i'm trying to right click and edit the tool path or or something like this. So in this case, it's really obvious because I have an island fill and um, potentially I could have a routing offset in my first example that wanted to share the same geometry. And it just, you could see that it just wasn't working. Stuff was going wrong. That's because you can't share the same geometry like that. And so you have to you have to copy and paste or make duplicate geometry. Well, then if you duplicate and copy the same geometry, you end up with duplicate lines on top of each other and it becomes really difficult to click on one line versus the other. So it, it you know it becomes really difficult. Or um, in this case, once I put an island fill down, I mean, having to zoom in here and try and make sure I click on the right thing, the right tool path, that's, that's a pain. Um, I, I don't wanna have to do that. And I'm going to have to try and fight through every single one of these lines to select all my E, my N, my O. I don't want to have to do that. I just want to be able to go to a layer and say, yep, I can, I can go to my engraved layer, select all of them at once, just like that, and then change it. I don't want to have to sit there and try and fight through a different tool path that's on top of it. It, just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so that's kind of why. But if you can... If you can put a bunch of stuff on the same layer, that's okay. Uh, it's just I like to keep the stuff that's overlapping on different layers. So that's a little bit of a clarification maybe on that. Because you could probably go overboard on layers if you really wanted to. <laughs> that, you know. 
All right, we've got a question from Gerald. How do you use the move lock on the layers and how would this be useful to use? Okay, so a move lock is going to be, um, it doesn't allow, what it does is that it, it does not allow you to move an object from that layer. Now, I believe the, and it's been a while since I've done this, I've used those two options, but let's just see if we can put up a little example here. So, we're gonna do this one, new layer, put this one on lock. So layer two will be locked. All right, then I've got this on there. So uh, layer, so lock, as you can see, let's delete that extra one. So if I turn on all layers, I'm able to select this one and I'm able to move it and change position. Lock, I'm not, uh, I'm not allowed to select it. I'm not even allowed to click on it. It's just a reference point. Now, I do believe I can use my, so I can use these here. So this is, would be my, my snaps, but I can't use them here. Like it won't let me click on them. If I go back into my layers and use a move lock, slightly different, I'm allowed to select it, but when I move it, it pops back into position. I believe then also I am now allowed to use my snaps on both layers. So one of them completely locks down the layer. So if I use lock, it just locks everything. I can't touch it, I can't select it, I can't move it, I can't even snap to the point. Where move lock allows me to still select it, I can use the snaps, so it's a little bit more of a soft lock. Um, so that's the difference between the two. Right, and then Bill's got a question. He's asking, does seven and route seven support text coloring in different layers? It seems that six won't change the color of text when it's on a new colored layer. Uh, text typically in uh, en route has always been purple, so. We go to here. If it's in text format, I don't think so. So let's just change the color here. Let's undo that. Uh, let's just change it to something that might be easy to see here. So red. And let's change this up to green. So no, text will always stay in its purple form. That will change once that gets converted to curves, I believe. Yes. So once it gets converted to curves, so lines and arcs, then it gets it would get transferred into that new color. So text no. If it's a if it's still in its text format, no. Uh, but that's because we want to make sure that we indicate to the person designing that that is still text and it's not uh, and it's not lines and arcs uh, because if you're going to toolpath it has to be converted to lines and arcs anyway. Um, but okay, Tim's got a question. I'm going back to the. The last question, would the move lock be another way to use the alignment tools without it moving both selected shapes? I've had a hard time using the alignment tools when I wanted to move one shape to the other shape without the other shape changing location as well. Uh, you know what? That probably would be a really good uh, example of that. Let's just uh, quick do a little trial here. So move lock, okay. And then let's just say we want to center both of these, right? 
um, align the centers. Hmm. <laughs> did I choose the wrong one or did uh, Oh, the other one doesn't move, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Yeah, no, I. it doesn't look like it. That's weird. Yeah, no, it does not. Um, wow, is that acts really... Oh, you know what? Hold on. Uh, let's, let's step back here a second. Hold on. Uh, let's take let's take this outside shape out of it or maybe I could group that shape together that might be causing a problem let's try that this is a group um, no yeah that's weird because it doesn't allow this one to move oh that's interesting okay well no I guess not I guess that answers your question. <laughs> Um, that is odd. I've not seen that happen before. Um, hmm. let's, uh, let's undo the move lock here. Let me try one other thing. Uh, sometimes in en route, it does matter which object you select first. So if we select this shape first and then that shape, and then do our alignment. Now it still moves in both. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'll have to do some more testing on it and just figure out uh, if there's a way, if that's if that's uh, intended, or if there's a better way to do that. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll, I'll look into that for you. But that's weird. How when you move lock, it doesn't it doesn't keep that in place, and then it doesn't move the other one in position. So. Interesting. I'll have to look into that some more. Thanks for the question. That will definitely be something we'll look into and see if we can maybe improve because that seems like uh, that move lock thing was a good idea. So, Give it just another minute here to see if any other questions come in. While we're waiting, uh, I'll just remind you again, uh, Aaron mentioned it earlier, but our next webinar will be on July 19th, and it'll be a good one, creating a 3D sign from start to finish. And you definitely won't want to miss that. Um, and we'll send you follow-up emails after this webinar later today, and there will be a link to sign up for that in that email. So make sure you click on that and sign up for that one. Also, just a, just a quick note about that one. That one will probably be a little bit longer. Um, so, you know, I don't know... You know, that one might be, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. I don't know. I'm going to try and slow it down as much as possible. I'm going to practice my steps so that I can kind of work through it pretty quickly. But uh, just know that it might be a little bit longer one, just so you know. All right. Got another question from Tim. Is there ever a time when NROUTE merges layers automatically? Uh, yes. Uh... There's a couple instances where it will merge layers together. And I, I want to say nesting is one of them. Uh, so if you have a, like a, a file that you've created all these layers and then you try and grab that and nest it, it flattens it into one layer um, within NROUT. So that would be a, a circumstance. Uh, the process through ATP the ATP uses to bring in files, toolpath them, nest it. It does the same thing. It, it takes layered files, toolpath them before it nests, and then nests them. And so uh, that can happen there. So nesting is the biggest one I can think of as to where it merges those things together. Um, there might be... So for example, if you, one of the things that you could do is if I were to try and take this file, for example, and I took two layers at the same time. So if I went to my layers tab here and I turned on 
uh, both of those layers like that. And I tried to toolpath both objects, even though they're in different layers, I believe that they would be merged together because you can't toolpath two things and then have them be in separate layers. So if I were to try and add some kind of toolpath to these, even though they're in separate layers, it'll merge them into one layer. So that would be another circumstance where that would happen. Okay, Jasper's got another question. When importing from KCD, can you only import individual pieces or can you import the nested file? Uh, it has to be individual pieces. Um, that's kind of the way KCD works. Um, it creates a layered DXF file for the top side, back side, front side, left side, right side. So it creates a file for each. And that's how the ATP system works. So it looks at that layered file and then says, okay, you know, based on these layers, these are the tool or these are the strategies that I need to use. And then, and then it nests it from there. Um, if you have a pre-nested, um, if you have a pre-nested DXF file that's in layers already, you could import that and then use ATP with the active drawing option. Uh, that would work. Uh, but the layers would still need to be present for ATP to be able to do anything with it. So, um, yeah. But the way that works is that that's by design. Um, each part, then that way you have more granular control over each part. Uh, so that you can say, I want 15 of these, but only 10 of those or whatever. Um, and that's why they do them by part, not by nested sheet necessarily. It, 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 you start to lose some of your granular control on some of that stuff. Okay. Well, I've got one more question from Tim, and I think this is going to be the last one that we have time for here. Is there any way to avoid that merging during nesting? I've used layers to ease tool, tool pathing for complex routing, but then nested them and lost the layers. If I need to change anything after that point, like it didn't route like I wanted to, it's a pain to fix the issue. Any workarounds or better workflow to do this? Um, so what, what you might do is, um, uh, what, what you, my, I think my suggestion on this one might be, because I've had that happen to me before, believe me, uh, I've created a nice little file and then nested it and like, oh, come on. And then you lose it all. You're like, I should not have done that. So I know the feeling. Um, the best thing I think to do would be to create the file that you're going to nest and then treat nesting as its own little thing. And so create the file or files if you, if you have multiple files um, and then save them. And then just create a blank new document and import the files that you want. So when I import, uh, let's say, my ROU file here, so my NROUTE file, if I were to import this file, it doesn't affect the original file. So I can make changes to this now. I can nest it. I can import multiple other ROU files. Um, and then I can nest them and it doesn't affect the original because basically when you do import, it makes a copy of the original and puts it inside of NRoute and then the original is still original. So that would be the way is once you finish doing it and you're ready to nest, I would just nest in a new document. Or the other thing that you could do is if you don't want to do the import save thing, you could also do something like this where you have it open in a new document like this. Go to all layers, copy it, uh, go to your new nested layer, and then just paste everything to the active layer. Yes, it doesn't maintain its layers. Uh, actually, it does. What do you know? Interesting. It actually does keep the layers. Well, that's, that's funny. It keeps the layers, but it doesn't put the parts in the right layer. So that's interesting. But that's another way to do it. Uh, just copy and paste it from another file that you have open into a new file, then that way you don't lose your original. That's kind of the idea that I would, I would probably implement. Um, yeah. Okay. Got some good questions there. Thanks everyone for asking them and thanks Aaron for 
answering them. We'll go ahead and close it out for today because that's about all the time we have. Um, don't forget to sign up for our next NROT webinar. Like I mentioned, that'll be on July 19th. Um, make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter so you won't miss out on any webinars or other announcements. And you can sign up for that on our website. Thank you again for being here. We hope you learned something and we'll see you next time.